Uh, we got CS3. CS3. Okay, thank you very much for having me and for, and for the kind introduction, of course. So as you said, I'm working in some flavors of representation theory and you already mentioned topology. So today I would like to focus maybe on one aspect of my research, which I hope has some uh, connections to what people like at the OISD. Um, I also have other aspects which I don't want to mention too much. Uh, there is some obvious overlap with the group of, of uh, um, representation theory and combinatorial algebra group. I really want to focus more on the topological aspects so of quantum topology, um, mostly because my research had a huge floor uh, for a long time, and I'm trying to, well, trying to, I, I'm trying to get more interdisciplinary. And the OISD is certainly one of the most uh, prominent uh, research centers in interdisciplinary fields. Um, Right. So mathematics is just a very small part. For today, I just can tell you about mathematics and applications of my research to various fields of mathematics, in particular topology, as I said. But in the long run, I'm really hoping to, at one point, to say, um, I'm also doing research in whatever, um, biology or chemistry or whatever, well, whatever works. And I think the kind of main intersection here would be more um, my work on combinatorial topology or uh, low dimensional topology, quantum topology, whatever you want to call it. We'll see. So my thumbnail picture, as you can see here, is this funny little knot. Um, I will go back to this funny little knot, knot later. Um, and this is basically uh, my, my favorite thumbnail picture because this is how, this is my life, right? not just my research, but also my life. So this knot actually, as you can definitely tell immediately, is just unknotted, so this is not really knotted. This is a uh, uh, this is a um, visual uh, optical illusion. This is really not knotted. So you can unknot it, but it's absolutely not clear. And kind of what representation theory wants to do for you is uh, they want to provide a machine that takes such a complicated picture and tells you actually, oh, by the way, this is too completely trivial um, without you doing any kind of uh, mental yoga here to see that this knot actually is true. Okay, so let me get started. Uh, so today, uh, first of all, I will kind of explain where representation theory comes from, and then I will zoom in on, on this uh, factor of quantum topology, or quantum, I think I will call it quantum algebra, but whatever you want to call it. Something related to, to those guys here, to knots. Okay, so let's get going. So um, my first slide is just a, a where we are slide, uh, or where I am, basically. So um, I, so this is my favorite map of pure mathematics. Um, of course, giving a map of pure mathematics is always dangerous because some people might complain. So uh, the experts in mathematics here will realize that, for example, I wouldn't count number theory as, a, as a one of the major fields of mathematics. That's a very debatable, of course. But anyway, so I have uh, six major fields of mathematics, a, a red one here, uh, a purple one here, a gray one somewhere in the background, which is geometry, is a little bit hard to see. It, it goes something like, like this. Um, and the orange one here, that's topology, that's where I'm going to zoom in in a second. Uh, I have a logic one here, and I have a discrete mathematics here. So you already have a group working kind of in this part of, of mathematics, or kind of intersection of algebra and um, discrete mathematics, and I would like to tell you a little bit more about the intersection of representation theory, which is this black bubble here on the uh, on the left, and topology, which is roughly here. You should think of this big picture as living on a square or on a torus, so I can go out here, and I will come back here, and I can go out here, and I will come back here. So all of these fields obviously really in, in, uh, overlap. So what are the fields? Well, the fields are analogous, which is uh, very prominent at the YSD, that's for sure. Uh, it's a study, basically, the study of change. Geometry is a study of, of sh shapes, and topology is also the study of shapes. So topology is this orange bubble thing, um, but they are kind of a different, different in flavor. While um, geometry cares more about angles and areas and so on, topology cares more about uh, the intrinsic properties of shapes. Logic is kind of the underlying language, um, as you can see. I'm also doing part of logic, I'm doing a little bit of homolo homological algebra and category theory, but I won't go there today. I'm also doing a little bit of 
So this, this dotted line, as we will see in a second, is basically the outreach of my research. Anyway, um, discrete mathematics is the study of discrete structures, and algebra is the study of basically of structure itself. And our little friend representation theory, um, here is this little black box. That's my research area, that's what I'm going to explain. Um, and the point of representation theory, at least for me, is I don't want to do representation theory for the purpose of doing representation theory, which is a lie, I really want to do representation, do representation theory for the purpose of representation theory. But um, um, it's also very nice because it's very applicable, uh, basically throughout mathematics, um, and in particular in this blue dashed bubble. That's what I'm, well, Today I only have 45 minutes, so I can't explain the whole blue dash bubble. That's basically my research outreach as it is right now. As I said, that's really disappointing because, well, it covers a bit, bit of pure mathematics, but it certainly doesn't cover anything else, and that's, that's really bad. So uh, one of my one of my main future goals for uh, coming maybe to the OISD would be to really um, increase the, my, my research outreach. Anyway, so the dash box is where I like to apply representation theory, and I will zoom in on those guys in a second. So on those funny, funny little pictures. But first of all, I would want to get started with why, what is representation theory? Why should I care? And at the very end, I will explain kind of a, a modern version of representation theory, which I will go a little bit into depth uh, in, in the second talk. So here I will be just really brief because 45 minutes will fly by in a second. By in just, just a blink of an eye. So representation theory started as follows. So you have a structure. Uh, let's say you have this uh, street sign which I stole from from uh, the, the Wikipedia page on, on Finnish street signs. So this is a Finnish, uh, uh, so a real world street sign from Finland. And you might wonder, you stare at it and you see mm -hmm. there is some symmetry in this street sign, obviously. And what kind of symmetry is it and how can we capture it mathematically? That's the start of um, of what is called group theory. So I will, I will, we will discover group theory together now live. Okay, so I will explain group theory in five minutes and then I will zoom in on representation theory. Group theory should be the study of symmetries of structures like the street sign from Finland, this roundabout sign. And how can we see this? Well, I claim this sign has a threefold rotational symmetry. I will rotate in this direction. And you can see it here on the right hand side um, there is, so I marked one of the arrows to make it easier to see how I rotate, but this arrow really is not marked. You will see that in a second again. Um, I have my do nothing operation. I have a rotation by rotating it once to the left, and I have the H rotation by rotating it twice to the left. And it turns out that this just operation on spaces on, on, on this street sign they actually form a mathematical object which people call a group. So you could write down a multiplication table here, uh, and don't worry too much, this is basically how it looks like. Um, so if you, for example, if you do nothing, this is my green box, and then you do a G operation, then you just have done a G operation, and the G operation is the one turn, of course, because you have done nothing before. Um, maybe a little bit more complicated to see would be red and red, um, so if you do G, so you move this one to here, I should use a different color, you move this one to here, and then you move it once further, then it's the same as operation H. Right? So those things form a nice um, algebraic structure, a mathematical structure, which people will call a group. Okay? So, but just keep in mind that um, take your favorite object, a street sign from Finland, and I'll try to formalize what it means to have to, to be a symmetry of, of this object. Um, and symmetry is really everywhere, and that's kind of the starting point where representation theory is so useful throughout mathematics and throughout the sciences. So um, kind of the classical examples in mathematics that you will see are dice, or uh, more strictly speaking, platonic solids. So um, the five platonic solids here in form dice and you can think of uh, the various symmetries of those objects. I will show you an animation in a second. Um, but also they appear in nature. So I stole this here from a, from a paper using representation theory. I think it was in, in chemistry. And in chemistry, it's, it's kind of well known for a long time that kind of what really matters uh, for if you look at 
various molecules, various compounds. Well, okay, certainly their atoms also matter, but also how they arrange themselves in space. This gets more important if the um, compounds get bigger and bigger, but in this small example, as you can see here, it's really the same idea as in my speed sign. There's one marked, one marked um, uh, atom, and you can see the rotational symmetry by... It, it's really exactly the same. It's, it's a three-fold symmetry. Okay, so let me explain the... Um, this little dice picture, um, if I can find it, holy shit, um, no, it's gone, where are you, okay, uh, give me a second, somewhere, somewhere gone, um, okay, here you go, takes a while to load, give me a second. Uh, okay. So here's a Mathematica demonstration. Ah, come on. Yeah, so this is life. I am very good. So here are the five platonic solids, maybe. Uh, Dodicate one takes a while to load. And oop. The isocahedron also takes a while to load. So maybe let's do the cube. That's the one everyone knows. So here's the cube, as you can see. And you have this axis, and you can raise an angle. And the point is, the symmetry is when the object turns, gets back to where it started. So you can still see the shadow in the background, and I can do a one turn, two turns, three turns, four turns, so around this axis it has a four-fold symmetry, which you would expect if you just look at the cube, of course. And those symmetries will form this nice object called the group. So I have this axis of symmetry, and I turn it, ah, it's not quite there, there you go, it's a one and a two turn, so this is a two-fold symmetry around this axis, and here's another one, and this is a one, two, three-fold symmetry around this axis and it will turn out that uh, the associated group of symmetries in this case uh, has eight elements and the eight elements spanning it are those rotations and those rotations which if you do the mental yoga will give you a way to create those rotations. Right? So you have three axes and those three axes have a two-fold symmetry, rotational symmetry, a three-fold rotational symmetry, and a four-fold rotational symmetry. But the four-fold rotational symmetry you can you can obtain it by using the other symmetries. Okay, so um, back to my slides, um, and that's kind of a general pattern in mathematics or in, in life itself. So those funny symmetries. So in mathematics, then it comes down to studying discrete symmetries, which are finite groups which I explain in a second. Um, you can study smooth symmetries, which are usually Lie groups or they are associated Lie algebras. That's what I like to do. You can study more sophisticated parts uh, like algebras themselves. But you can just think of naively as things being symmetries of certain systems. And in particular, the first two are really, really just the discrete symmetries. That's what, that's what I showed you, rotational symmetries of funny objects. Smooth symmetries would be, for example, um, if you have something like S plus 3, which is uh, the group of rotations of 3 space, then, then you would have something like uh, smooth symmetries. The underlying idea is always the same. You write down a list of axioms. Um, you, what you usually see, and now we have discovered group theory together, is this list of axioms A, B, C, D. You have a multiplication that just means you can stack symmetries. So you do one operation, you do the other one, you stack them together, you get a third operation. Um, associativity is kind of obvious from the picture. I, I don't even need brackets in my uh, explanation or in my definition using symmetries. You have the do-nothing operation, that's number C, and you have the inverse operation. Um, so if I, if I do a rotation like this, I can also do a rotation like this. So they invert one another, and more fancy versions of, of this, of course. Um, at the bottom, you see how this works in practice. For now, not a, not a, not the street sign anymore, but for the pentagon, the hexagon. So uh, the 
colored object in the background. Um, and here comes something funny. So in order to illustrate, I, I, I told you symmetries is something like um, I, I do something on the object while you look away, and I, I did it, and you, you then look again, and it's still the same object. In order to highlight that, so it's really a symmetry of the object, you can't tell the difference. In order to highlight that, what I do is I put in an unsymmetric object. I did the same here. I marked one of the arrows. Because the whole point is uh, a symmetry is something that if you look and you look away, I do something and you again look and then you can't tell the difference. So I, I can't illustrate any symmetry un unless I break the symmetry by putting in an asymmetric object. And as you can see here, my f is asymmetric, and then I can illustrate rotation uh, again in this direction. And there's another operation, so this, I call this R, and you can do this five times, and you are already have understood what this means. Um, you can also reflect, and I call this S. So this is just really reflecting along this axis here, and then you can compose them together here. For example, is the uh, S R so. Uh, uh, reflect, rotate, 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 rotate operation. And if you would do that and you follow all the, the steps here, it, it would go all the way from here to here, then you will see that this is exactly what I did here. And if you take this seriously, that's what I said, you just discover group theory. So this is group theory. It's group theory is um, study of symmetries of certain objects formalized in an abstract way. Okay. So in an abstract way. So you would formalize it like, oh, there's a set having a certain number of operations. Or having an operation satisfying a certain number of axioms. And this, this is where representation theory kicks in. So um, we just discovered group theory. Um, if you would now sit down and write it down, then actually you could do it. Um, but representation theory, and that's the whole approach, now takes ABCD, which live in an abstract framework. Think about the number three which is an abstract instance, or think about three triangles, which is a particular model of the number three. Um, so those, this list here is like the number three, and representation theory is like the specific model. Instead of three tri triangles, you use something different, uh, which is still familiar, and then you try to go from on from there. So representation theory, that's why my slogan for the slide, is like symmetries in vector spaces. And I haven't told you why, because um, the idea now is to use those abstract symmetries, which are really hard, and to push them in something familiar, in particular uh, in the realm of linear algebra. So you would associate a representation, uh, that's just the name, to uh, each such symmetry uh, by choosing a certain vector space. So here I've chosen a two-dimensional vector space, um, let's say something like complex numbers squared or real numbers, whatever you want. So I certainly need some, some certain rules of unities here. Don't look too much at the entries, by the way. It doesn't really matter. The point is these are matrices, uh, so in the familiar realm of linear algebra and kind of the main slogans of mathematics from the last 150 years was that linear algebra is kind of the easiest part of mathematics. Everything ever in linear algebra can be solved by some form of an algorithm. You can compute everything you want using some form of an algorithm, which is great. So representation theory pushes this abstract study of symmetries in um, the realm of, um, of linear algebra, so in the realm of algorithms, which it's really the point why it is so powerful. Symmetries are everywhere, and linear algebra is easy. So kind of, kind of converge of those two. Um, and yeah, so certainly you can do even more. So that's kind of the motive. Well, the internal motivation is you can now do actually more with a representation than just with an abstract symmetry. You can talk about basic building blocks, the elements of the theory, therefore simple representations. You can vary the scalars. So I just told you I need a square root of 3 here. So what do I do if I don't have a square root of 3, like I work over the, over the rational numbers? Um, then things change, and you can play many other games, and that's kind of the heart of representation. And you take a symmetry, you push it into the realm of linear algebra, and then you do your linear algebra. Um, and really, that's then in the end the approach of representation theory. You have a problem involving an action. That's a problem nature gives you. It might be a symmetry of a molecule. It might be a symmetry of a, of, of a polygon. It might be a symmetry of a physical system or whatever. 
And that's hard, that's really hard, and you don't really know what to do, there's not, not enough uh, structure to play around. You push it into the realm of linear algebra, you get a linear action, so this arrow, and then you can do your linear algebra games. For example, you can decompose it into those elements, and then you hope to, uh, to be able to get all the way back and get some new insights. And that really works. It, 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 it looks a little bit strange, why should it work, but it actually really works in practice. Um, and it really oft, very often has a satisfying answer. So as an abstract representation theory, one well, of the main question is to kind of uh, classify the elements of the theory, to write on the periodic table of those symbols. And as a more applied representation theorist, you would like to, like, like to take a problem that comes up in nature, uh, push it into your machine, see what comes out, and, and see what, what, what this red arrow, arrow back is telling you about the original problem. Okay, so um, Wikipedia actually quotes representation theory is persuasive across fields of mathematics, so it really turns up in all the main six fields, and I will zoom on, in, uh, on, on an aspect in a second, and this will be the rest of my talk, uh, up to a little bit of, in the last two minutes I'm going to explain, or to going to sketch what categorical representation theory should be all about. And um, during, while doing so, I also tell you a little bit about my own results, which is, uh, I don't know, I don't like to talk about myself, uh, so it's already hard to talk about myself, so it's probably very hard to listen to someone talking, talking about me, um, so I, I will be very brief. Um, maybe you can, you can ask some, uh, some questions if you would like to know a little bit more about my work. Anyway, so the whole point, um, so this is kind of well known, and the stuff that is not well known, at least not to me, is that, um, well, that's, it's also well known that representation theory is, is persuasive uh, uh, across the fields of sciences. It's just not as well known as it deserves to be. In particular, I would like to study that really further. And I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that at the OIC there would be a really good opportunity for me uh, to push those ideas further. So I just stole, this, um, to stole those slides from, uh, from a talk by someone in 2014 uh, at the University of Chicago, and they list this huge list of applications of uh, representation theory, some of which I have heard of, like robotics, some of which I have never heard of, like voting, and um, actually these are very nice slides. Um, so if you Google uh, applied representation theory, you will fi find those slides, and those slides discuss actually representation theory and voting. Um, so uh, a lot of things to, for me to improve on like really, really getting more out of my research, like applying representation theory to error code, correcting codes, whatever. You get the point. For now, I'm just staying within mathematics, and um, the field of mathematics I would like to, to discuss today is, uh, which is very applicable to, which, which is uh, very applicable to representation theory, very surprisingly, is not theory, or in the end, whatever kind of quantum algebra, and a knot is really something extremely silly. Um, it's you take a rope, so here's a picture. So you take a rope and you glue its ends together. So if someone has built those things out of rope and used some, some tape to glue the ends together. And whatever you get is a knot. Okay? Take a rope, put the ends together, knot it in some way, put the ends together, whatever you get is a knot. And you might end up with this guy here on the right, with, which is called a trefoil. And if you do the crossing, uh, so those things are called crossings, if you do it the opposite way, you might be unlucky and you get some, something that's called the unknot, and the unknot is just this picture, the naive version that you can ever think of as knotting a rope, yeah? you don't knot it at all, you just close the ends. Uh, knots can get very complicated, as you can see here, um, and they appear in real life, we'll see that in a second, but let me first show you an animation why in mathematics that's maybe the only complicated part here. In mathematics you always want to close the knots. Okay? So if I think at least of knots, I would usually would well I'm certainly from prehistorical times, so in prehistorical times most of my computer equipment still had a lot of cables around and they liked to knot it themselves. Um, nowadays almost nothing here has any cable anymore, which is uh, very nice because I get very annoyed when things knotted. Um, that's not quite a mathematical knot, you would need to push the ends together. Uh, so let me show you actually why you want to do that, because uh, mathematically speaking, you could undo any knot 
Um, here's my animation. This is a mathematical animation. You put undo any knot if you're not closing it. So this operation will construct a knot, not quite close it, and then undo it for you. So let's have a look. So it constructs a knot, this funny uh, knot on the right hand side of my slide, and it doesn't quite close it, and you can easily undo it again. Well, maybe not easily, but you certainly can undo it. And let me give one more go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, almost closed, and you can undo it. And that's certainly not what you want, because if you just, um, if we could just look at this knot here, so those two certainly shouldn't be equivalent in your theory. That would be really bad because then your theory would be pretty boring. Anyway, um, so what people like to study then is not as a three-dimensional object. I don't know how you feel. Um, I already have trouble to well uh, to think about three-dimensional objects. I like to draw something on the plane. I'd like to like to draw something in, in two two space. And what people then like to study is um, they study projection. And this is really the picture for the projection of exactly this funny trefoil. Um, so you think of it like somewhere in your three space you have, you have a lighting and you project the shadow on the wall. Uh, so you can get this picture for example, or this picture, or this picture. And this really depends on the positioning of your of your of, of your lighter, right? Or of your wall, where you ever want to read of the read of the shell. And there's one additional type, type, uh, type of information you keep here. So you're not just remembering the shadow, you're also remembering which crossing goes under and which crossing goes over. Okay. So um, uh, this is really bad. Let me give it another try. Uh, so over, under, over, under, over, under, over, under. So here's my trefoil. And this is the shadow of the trefoil here. I hope I got it correct. And the only extra information uh, uh, above the shadow is I, I keep track of which is over and which is under. And this is again something that appears in nature all the time. So on the right hand side is a picture I stole from a paper discussing knotted, knottedness of proteins. So I, I try to explain that uh, if you have a big molecule, it kind of also not just matters from or its little at atomic uh, com compounds, but it also matters how it arranges itself in space. And it turns out that for something like proteins or DNA or whatever, this seems to be a very crucial question, which I would really like to understand a little bit uh, in more details. But it, it, it's really a, exactly the same picture as you can see, so from, from completely different sources. So I stole the left hand side from a mass paper, and I stole the right hand side from a, I think it was a, chemis a chemistry paper. And it's a really the same idea. So they, they might turn up in practice as uh, certain projections, and they might look very different. And the main question is, uh, well, you only get this projection, but you know it's actually a three-dimensional object. So what can you do to distinguish that? Right? So um, if you just see the, those projections, what can you do to distinguish that? Okay, so here is my thumbnail again. As I told you, uh, exercise, homework, this is actually the, the trivial knot. So this is a really, really complicated question to, to um, decide whether two knots are the same or not. Uh, for the experts, um, Cooperberg in 2012, I think, proved that um, the question whether a projection of a knot is unknotted or not is NP complete, assuming the Riemann hypothesis, meaning it's basically NP complete. Um, so this is a really, really hard problem. And on the right hand side and the left hand side, I did this slightly easier. So this is homework to, to untwist this. Uh, good luck, I never tried it myself. Um, uh, but on the right, right hand side, it's a little bit easier. I, I, I showed you uh, how to untwist another one of those, a slightly smaller one. And as you can see, it's, it's not trivial how to do that. There are a lot of steps involved, uh, but in the end, you can actually untwist it. And that's not what you want to do, because in, in practice, uh, your lot of proteins look more like this one here. And yeah, I mean, good luck trying to unknot that. It's much more efficient to use this approach of knot theory. A knot theory says, okay, what I want is I want a numerical datum associated to my to my knot. So on my thumbnail, I decided to say my numerical invariant for this knot is one. Um, for example, a numerical invariant can mean many things. I just mean something that you can compute. It could also it might might be a number, it might be a polynomial, it might be a matrix, it might be some, something you can compute. 
and it only depends on the knob, not on the projection. So each projection will, s each shadow will spit out the same number. And then you can actually tell, say something like, okay, I would play this game, and if I get diff two different numbers, two different invariants, then I have two different plots. For example, um, it's already a lot trivial question to say to see whether those two guys are the same or not. Um, let's say if you only sh see the shadows. The only way to prove it by hand is to, put, to build them out of rope and to convince yourself that you, that you can't undo the trapper on the left. It would be much more practical, in particular for huge knots, to just say this goes to number two, whatever, and this goes to number one, so the numbers are different, by some machine that computes that for you, uh, so the knots are different. And that's exactly what knot theory wants to do. So knot theory wants to say, give me a projection, I give you a number, and then list all projections that you have, and when the numbers are different, you're good to go. You're, you're uh, ready to say um, things are different. And this is where representation theory kicks in, because representation theory gives you a method to construct those numbers. Right? For now, I just said, OK, there's a magical machine that spits out numbers, so how do we get this magical machine? Um, oops. Turns out that the magical machine I would like to address here is, uh, let's say, something like the written, written recipe to write approach, which by now is fairly classical, uh, 30 years. For math standards, that's of course uh, very new, uh, but, but in some sense it's still very classical because the field is developing so fast. I, I'm pretty sure all of you know that, um, not just for mathematics, but in, in general, science is, is just. <laughs> Well, anyway, I'm starting waffling. Um, the point here is that there is a machine that takes some picture of a knot like this, and it produces a representation theoretical gadget on the other side. And it works roughly as follows. You put your knot in a nice position, the strict, uh, the formal word here is kind of a Morse position. That just means all the local components look like this, this, or this, and for each uh, slice that you horizontal slice here are my horizontal slices you associate a representation of a certain quantum group okay so that's a certain let's say a quantum version of a group that's not true but let's just say for today it's a quantum version of a group um, as we associate a representation into each basic piece you associate a certain map between those representations so a matrix so to each one of them you associate a certain matrix whatever uh, beta in my picture, and I call this one here evaluation, and I call this one here co-evaluation. Okay, certain maps. And then you piece everything together and you get a, a map, right? A matrix, basically. And you read off your numerical invariant corresponding to your model. And this whole construction this was really a breakthrough in mathematics. It it's not just producing one machine that produces one number for each knot, it produces a family, an infinite family of machines, and produces an infinite family of invariants. And those are called the written recipe to write invariants. And this part uh, of the theory is really what I like to study. And the whole point is that, okay, there you have this machinery, very good. Um, you get invariants of knots that you can apply, and actually people do apply that outside of, of mathematics and the sciences. So I think uh, one of the most famous uh, invariants of knots constructed in this way is the Jones polynomial. And it, it's, I, I know that some people, not me, I'm a pure mathematician, but uh, who knows what the future brings, but some people really use that in deciding decision problems whether certain molecules are knotted or not. Right? It is, I, I explained that here very briefly on one of my slides. Uh, I ha this problem is not just a problem of abstract mathematics, this is a problem of whatever, the sciences, if you want. So if you ask me at 2 a.m. in the morning what I'm going to do is, uh, what I'm doing for a living, it might be that I just reply quantum algebra. Because it's 2 a.m. in the morning and I'm not quite sure what I'm saying. Um, uh, but quantum algebra is certainly a, a big part of my research. Uh, some people call it quantum topology, whatever, I just call it quantum algebra. Um, and the quantum here comes from the quantum group. Uh, anyway, um, and this is really strongly merged with mathematics, so I stole one of those pictures here from one of my papers. And you can prove things about knot invariants using representation theoretical linear algebra type arguments. 
I'm not ex expecting you to understand what you see right now here in this white box. I just randomly copied it from one of my papers. Um, the point is, sometimes it gets actually pretty nice. So here I have something in green and here I have something in red. Um, and this is just a, a combinatorial way to illustrate those linear maps. And there's a nice symmetry that exchanges green and red. And that symmetry is related to a certain symmetry of, of not invariance. And so we get a very slick proof of a, of a symmetry of not invariance using representation theory, or in this case, even combinatorial representation theory. So um, with Rishiti, you derive relates representation theory and not theory in a crucial way, which I think is pretty impressive. And now you can play your games on linear algebra to decide whether two uh, knotted proteins are the same or not, which is uh, pretty pretty good, I think. Okay, so um, I have something like five minutes to go, and I would like to go a little bit into details what this categorical representation theory is, um, higher representation theory, two representation theory, whatever you want to call it, there are various names. This is pretty new. I would expect that you never heard of it before. Um, so it originates in early work of people like Kovanov Seidel, uh, Kovanov uh, Bondroquet about 20 years ago, uh, let's say 20 years ago, so a little bit newer than uh, the written measure you can derive machine. And it's the following idea. I don't want to, as associating matrices to symmetries is a very powerful way of, of studying symmetries and that's, as I said, has been around for a long time and is basically everywhere, in some sense, in uh, mathematics and the sciences. And those people just thought, um, maybe it's, maybe we can do better. Maybe we don't associate a, a matrix to a symmetry, but maybe a more sophisticated object. So what people would like to associate to it is a, is a so-called functor, whatever. Um, and the idea goes back to this um, uh, umbrella term of categorification. So categorification is again something very new. Um, maybe it originates in papers in the in the 1990s, but it, it's certainly a very new idea. In some sense, it's a very old idea because all of you know actually, uh, it, all of you have seen this in some way or the other. So you have some shadow, and you want to see what actually uh, produces the shadow. That's the main idea. So let me stay with this very simple example of having. The, the counting numbers here, so my natural numbers are down here, and I claim they are categorified by a certain category, um, whatever that means, and this is just a category of vector spaces. So uh, vector spaces are whatever you can think of, uh, r to the n, r, to the r, r, r squared, r cubed, whatever, whatever you want, something like that. And the way it works is as follows, I have my little counting numbers here, I have, uh, oh, I use k, okay, so k is just any any field, you, you can replace k by r, anyway, so I have my uh, little uh, vector spaces up here, um, and there's an easy map from, from up from bottom to top, that's a projection map, right, that's my spotlight that, that hits the knot and produces a shadow, I can just look at the dimension, so uh, the dimension of r squared is 2, so um, this one goes to this one. Uh, you can just take the dimension. The dimension of uh, R6 is 6. The dimension of R to the n is n, and so on. Okay, that's a bit naive, but actually the point is all the structures downstairs have a lift upstairs. For example, you can add numbers. You can say 1 plus 2 is 3. You could certainly do that. And you have a corresponding addition, it's called the direct sum, on vector spaces. So this one if you go downstairs, if you project it, you get the addition. And we have multiplication. I hope I did my algebra right. 2 times 3 is 6. And upstairs you have a corresponding uh, multiplication. It's called the tensor problem. Whatever it's called. It's really just the same, but on the higher level. And it decategorifies. So this is a decategorification. Decat. It decategorifies to uh, the little bubble down. Downstairs, you can say something like, uh, which one? 2 is bigger than 1, or 6 is bigger than 3, or the other way around, 1 is smaller than 2, something like that. And it's reflected up here by saying, we have, for example, surjection or an injection. Again, mathematical terms for a lift of the well-known structure downstairs for, for numbers. 
And the point is that the, the upstairs bubble is much richer. So I just chose one representative. I chose R to the N here. But actually, you can do any kind of vector space you want, as, lo as long as it's the same dimension. So the little bubbles here are actually universe on themselves. And similarly, the maps, you can choose any reasonable map. The, any, any error here is actually already a universe on itself. So the top is a much richer structure than the bottom. Okay. Everything at the bottom comes from the top, but the top is a much richer structure. So why should we just aim, if we already know that, why should we just aim to land somewhere here, if we can land somewhere here, right? Seems to be, seems to be a reasonable idea. Um, and that's the whole idea, right? So vector space with the bubble at the, at, the, at the top, for example, has a whole power of linear algebra at hand, while there's absolutely nothing comparable for my counting numbers. It's really, the counting numbers are really just a shadow of vector spaces. And that's the main idea, underlying idea of categorification. It's really this idea that all the time we have just seen, seen a shadow, a projection, and now we are looking at the object at the top, and we would like to see what that object actually is and what we can say about that object. And this is where two representation theory, categorical representation theory comes in. Um, so let me just go one step further. So representation theory is this idea to associate with a symmetry a linear map, a matrix. And actually, linear maps are, in some sense, shadows of richer objects which people call factors. And this categorical representation theory lifts a little bit higher. And as you can see here, this is slightly distorted. Oops, that was not very good. Give me another try. Um, this is slightly distorted here. So in each step, you, you could continue forever, in principle. And so in each step, you get a new layer of information. So there is no categorification. There is no shadow of this new layer, which is called the natural transformation. Um, there is no equivalent of a linear map downstairs in the realm of numbers. But here, you have a very nice correspondence. So the one of them I just explained for a vector space. You can take the dimension and go to numbers. So this whole idea of categorical representation theory is to lift representation theory itself to, to, a, new, to a new layer. So instead of associating uh, uh, linear maps, matrices you associate functors to your symmetries, whatever functors are. And the main idea is, of course, still the same. You have to actually you lift it, you decompose, you play some games like decompositions, and you get them inside. Okay. And, well, if you ask me at 2am in the morning, what am I doing? I'm still not uh, really at my senses, I might answer. I'm, I'm doing this exactly this, so categorification. I look at classical objects, I see whether they're shadow of more sophisticated objects living in, living in parts of, of category theory. So I just might answer at categorification. And before you ask, yes, there is some way to kind of categorify this approach of uh, written regime to be interact. So it, it really was a starting point, and kind of the next step was this idea of, of categorification. Um, so I'm already running out of time, so I just list a few applications of uh, re categorical representation theory right now. It's a little bit of a sad state of the art as it is right now, because it's really in mathematics. I have I've no, uh, no doubts that in the long run it will turn up in, in the sciences as well, but this will take a while. So the earliest result I find uh, about categorification and categorical representation theory is from 1999, which is relatively recent. Um, so it also took a while for representation theory to kick in in the sciences. But that's certainly something we should, as a group of people doing categorical representation theory or quantum algebra, we should definitely work on that. Um, but within mathematics, it's already very prominent in terms of in various fields of from geometry to combinatorics to various versions of low-dimensional topology. It, it's really, really uh, a big field of mathematics. Um, yeah, and that is all I wanted to tell you about today. And um, um, yeah, thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Daniel. So now uh, his uh, uh, talk is uh, open for questions and discussions. Any uh, questions? Please unmute uh, and start speaking. Hi, can I ask a question? Sure. Oh, yes, please. Uh, 
so in your slide about the Witten, Rashtik, and Derev, you said something read. about quantum groups, but you didn't say, obviously you weren't going into much detail yet, is it a specific quantum group, or is it an arbitrary quantum group that you put into this machine? Um, you can feed in those guys for any semi-simple Lie algebra G. Okay. So SL2, SL3, uh, SO5, something like that. A finite as well, or just finite? Um, in the original, just finite. Um, but I'm pretty sure some people have worked on, on affine Lie algebra as well. Theory here? Yes, you can. There is a categorification of this picture. And you get a. It's, so in this picture, you would get a polynomial like the Jones polynomial. So if you go from here to here, um, let's say Jones. And if you, if you apply the categorification picture, you would get a, a homology theory, which would be something like Kovanov homology. But yes, you can. So yes.
but maybe I'm just trying to understand something that's beyond the accident meant to be in Well, it's never wrong to, to, to dream. <laughs> I mean, I, I would like to understand the real world application, as I said. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but it sounds like a really good question, but right now I don't have an answer. I, I don't know any field yeah. in mathematics that really studies, but well, maybe except low dimensional topology itself, which really studies the. Um, maybe I do actually. Um, okay. Um, so what you can do here, let me try to dream a little bit. Um, so if you look at the categorification of this picture, what you would also get is uh, so the categorification of this picture. Give me a second. Too many slides. So what we will also get is a new kind of information. And those things, Eric, actually correspond to cobordisms, so certain surfaces connecting the, the different projections of knots. So there is an information uh, um, how projections change, but I, I think it's on the next level of, um, of, of this tower of structures. But okay. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just that the analogy seemed very powerful to me, but I just had no idea what, what you would then do with it. Now that yeah, that very, very good question. Very good question. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Hi. May I ask a question? Sure. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. I'm uh, not an expert, but I'm studying brain science. I wonder whether representation theory or category theory has something to do with information theory in your now. I'm I'm sure. Um, oh no, I only have something on representation theory. So, um, as far as I know, abstract category theory is applied to computer sciences because you can think of um, you can think of a programming language actually as a category. I'm not quite sure what those people are doing. That would be something um, to look into. But yes, as far as I can tell, there is some connection from uh, from Category theory, which is one aspect here, to um, uh, to computer science, and with computer science, I, I think you should answer your question. Um, but so representation theory also turns up in in those fields here. And again, I would like to know more about it, but I am pretty sure that there should be something to talk about. Absolutely. So we have uh, five more, more minutes. Can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a biologist, but I was interested when you mentioned about using nonvariance to classify proteins. Or, but uh, as far as I know, again, I'm not a biologist. Uh, I thought proteins didn't obey this property of that you gave of knots where they have to, the ends have to be connected together? Yes, like I thought that, that's, pro that's probably so, yeah. right. Um, but in practice it kind of doesn't matter. So it's just, the mathemat in mathematics you need to do it because otherwise it gets trivial. But then I guess, so do you mean there's some other, there's some other constraint on the proteins that means things don't be I, I, I think this animation that I showed you, um, well, again, I'm not a biologist, but let me just... I, I, I'm pretty sure that a protein cannot do this uh, undoing itself. And that's what you would need to do yeah. in order to, um, to undo the knot. Right. I'm not a biologist, so but that, that's what I think it would be. That kind of suggests that the, the invariant might not be exactly the same then if the rules for what you're allowed to do to deform the structures. Um, so, what you can do is you can study, study something that is called a knottoid. That is, it is really like cutting a knot and pretending that you have two open ends and you can still apply representation theory and not invariance to, to those. But strictly speaking, you are correct. I think the protein doesn't quite fit in the mathematical framework of knots, but I don't think it's a big problem. Yeah, so Daniel, could you go back to your last slide? Absolutely. So it takes a while, give me a second. Where you presented the, uh, pre uh, the final slide, yeah, so the, you pre yeah, yeah, this one. 
So these are like uh, uh, past uh, uh, successes uh, of uh, categorical representation theory. That's right. Yeah. So uh, how do you think about the future? So uh, in uh, in addition to this, uh, what uh, uh, new domains do you think uh, uh, you can uh, apply the categorical representation theory? That's a very good question. Um, so uh, there are still many open questions in, in, in this part of mathematics. Um, and so in this part, let me just actually let me just pull up my, my slides again because somehow my last slide broke. I actually have the last slide. Um, so what we did, and that's what I kind of explained in this varying of, of the shadow picture is so what we proved is that actually all those link invariants that you see downstairs, upstairs, uh, lift to something which is called factorial. So they tell you something about those funny cobalism pictures, um, and these ones here, um, between those knots, which you can think of as, as you can see downstairs, you have two parallel lines, and upstairs you have two crossing lines. So it's really, really like varying the, the projection. And um, this certainly has some impact in four dimension topology. So this must be the, kind of the first step. And so people already work on this, so and there's a lot of open questions. Um, why is it four dimensional topology? Because secretly, uh, as you can see, my, my picture intersects, uh, but it doesn't intersect in four space. If you can imagine four space, it wouldn't intersect in four space. So that's why you're doing four dimensional topology. Don't worry about it too much. Um, another open question. So actually, my last slide was, uh, thank you for your attention, but some of that broke. So let me just pull that up. Um, so another question I had in mind is to apply this machinery to group theory. Um, so that's what we are trying to do right now. Um, so what you can do is if you have a group and the group is very complicated, um, then you might, might look at the representation. The representation might be easier. So what you are up for is what is called a faceful representation, so an injective representation. So you can tell whether two group elements are the same by looking at the matrices. For certain groups, that is just ridiculously hard to find, and particularly if your group is infinite, um, those groups turn up as, as certain symmetries of certain more complicated systems. Uh, some of them, again, uh, come from um, the sciences, like, like brain groups. So instead of trying to find a representation of those guys, uh, which can tell things apart, you look at the categorical representation of those guys, which can tell things apart. And that seems to be a, a very fruitful direction of research, which is pretty much widely open as we speak. Um, but otherwise, I would hope to understand more about, as I said, uh, I have no idea about dotting of proteins. Maybe that would be a good, good thing to discuss and to, to push that, those ideas further. Maybe in relation to, as I just try to dream about, uh, varying projections by looking at uh, the higher information contained in those higher not invariants. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Daniel. So uh, it's about time uh, to uh, close uh, this uh, seminar. And uh, uh, thank you again uh, for your uh, uh, introduction and about uh, 